All right, I am live on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, on the Facebook mentions. So, I, uh, using my iPhone, this is a neat new feature that Facebook has, and let me see here, uh, okay, there's comments, people are free to ask questions, okay, doesn't go sideways, it's only a vertical app, okay, got it straight, got it straight, okay, so people are I'm just going to try this out. This is a new feature. It's Facebook Live. It's sort of like Google Hangouts, except it's just one way only. Jeff Tucker introduced me to it and suggested I try this. I am on my iPhone. I'm using a, a regular mic, uh, earbud mic. I was actually going to use this because you can plug it into a USB adapter to the iPhone, but my iPhone's almost out of power, so that lightning port is taken. Anyway, so I'm looking forward to anyone typing questions. We already have nine viewers. I guess it's going to start growing. Um, I had mentioned this the other day, and some people had suggested some questions, so I'll go ahead and start with some of those. I did a, a show with Tom Woods the other day on um, uh, libertarian theory of non the non-aggression principle, and we're trying to rebut some of the opposition, some of the arguments against it, some of the criticisms of the non-aggression principle. Um, I think the show was pretty popular. We did a good job, but it was only 30 minutes. We only had so much time. In the meantime, some people like Scott Bowers and others told me that I speak really fast uh, for a Southerner, I guess, or just in general. I don't know, and that is probably true, so maybe I need to slow down sometimes. I don't know. Just my style, especially when I know I have a clock and I only have uh, so much time to speak. And um, in any case, um, I actually had not had much time to prepare on the – uh, issues that Tom and I were going to discuss just because of the way we did it at the last minute. So I think I could have been more prepared. But anyway, I was pretty happy with it. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Sebastian Ortiz, mentioned that um, – <coughs> excuse me. He mentioned that um, he thinks at the end I shouldn't have uh, implied that my views on the positive obligations parents arguably have towards children – is, I guess, plumb line libertarianism, Rothbardianism. I didn't mean to. I think I was pretty clear that uh, Rothbard and Walter Block, for example, have a different view on that. Uh, it's just my personal view, and it's not that fleshed out, but I've written on it, and uh, I'm leaning that way. Let me put it that way. Uh, but I also agree that children's um, – uh, the rights of children – as against their parents is not really practically that enforceable in most cases. You can't have a legal system or a court compel a parent to be a good parent. So it's not really that practical of a right to have or practical of an obligation to have, but it does have – it could have some legal implications. Um, someone else on another thread on Facebook, when I mentioned I might do this a few days ago, asked me to address um, – let's see here. I'm looking on Facebook. It's on Facebook now. I'm not sure where the comments are supposed to show up. Jeff told me they showed up on the iPhone. If anyone's typing comments, I do not see any comments, and I'm not sure why. Let me click on the comments button. No, they're hidden. Maybe no one's typing comments. Um, if anyone could just type a test comment, i see if it comes up. Oh, okay, there we go. Well, I see a join message. So let me hit this button. See what happens. Okay, that just turns the camera around. Okay. It's a pretty cool feature, i got to say. Um, I see your comment. Sean White just posted a comment, but it's on – oh, now I see it. Okay. Yeah, it's working. So good. So if anyone wants to type a question, I'd be happy to address it. Any libertarian theory issue, um, anything you want me to uh, go into, I'd be happy to. One person said they wished in the Tom Woods video that I had uh, discussed the issue of verbal threats in more detail. Um, let me let me just point out something. I think in the um, let me hit a, yeah thumbs up. Hey Jack, my Jack, my buddy Jack Chris just joined too. Jack, you need to try this feature out. It's pretty cool. So the issue of verbal threats. When do they arise? Rise to the level of aggression? Here's how I look at it. Uh, in the law, in the common law. And in the civil law, the two major legal systems, there is a, uh, a type of crime called assault. Now, most people are familiar with the term assault and battery, and we use that sort of to describe when someone beats someone else up. But technically in the law, uh, the offensive touching is the battery. Okay, thumbs up on Jack's point. 
thing. The, the, uh, an offensive touching is a battery, and that can include, by the way, noxious gas or fumes. Um, any, any basically physical interference with someone's body that they don't appreciate. A, 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 an offensive touching, and of course including more se serious touchings like um, hitting someone in the face or stabbing them or shooting them or uh, molesting them or whatever. Um, that's a battery. Assault is coupled with battery because assault is related to it, but it is separate. Assault is defined in the law. Now, I'm just telling you what it's defined in the positive law. Then we can discuss whether that should be also a type of crime in libertarianism. Um, assault is the is one of two things. It's the it's the um, the attempt to commit a battery. Now, since battery is an intentional action, every time you batter someone. You always assaulted them because you have to intend to batter them to actually intentionally batter them. So every time you batter someone, there's always there's also assault of that type, the first type, intention, the intent or the attempt to batter someone. But if you if you try to hit someone, that's assault, but it's not battery because you didn't succeed. But it's still assault. It's an attempt at battering someone. Okay. Um, now, the other question I'm going to have is, can I scroll down on these comments? Oh, I can. Good. So I can see the ones that go by that I, I'm not um, talking about now. Hello, Sebastian. I see you've joined. I just mentioned you earlier. Um, now, the other type of assault in the law is um, intentionally pl placing someone in, in fear of receiving a battery. So the example I gave in Tom Woods is the classical example in the law. Um, if... I have a friend who's sleeping, and I swing an axe at their head, trying to kill them, but I miss. That is assault of the first type. It's an attempt at battery, and that is a crime in the law. And I think it should be a crime in libertarian law, too, and I can explain why. If I have a friend, and I point a blank gun at them, and I pretend to pull the trigger, or I pull the trigger, and I make them believe I'm about to shoot them, but it's really an unloaded gun, or it's a fake gun, and I know this, but they don't, then it's not really an attempted murder, but it is still uh, placing the victim in, in fear, reasonably placed, uh, in, in reasonable fear of receiving a battery. And that is also a crime under, under most um, Western legal systems that I, I understand, at least the civil law in Louisiana. So I, I think of those both as types of threat, and so the question is why in libertarianism would a threat be a crime? And then you can go. You can use that to other other cases like stalking, right, or verbal threats. Why should these or should they be considered aggression under libertarianism? And I think they should. I actually think the common law crimes of assault of both types are species of aggression, and the common law is right to classify them as types of crimes. And the reason I give is something I go into in some of my writings, like my my nineteen I think ninety five. If you go to my website. Um, StephanKinsella.com. You'll see I have some articles from the Journal of Libertarian Studies and one in the Loyola of Los Angeles Law Review on uh, estoppel and a punishment, uh, a theory of rights, a libertarian theory of rights based upon estoppel and punishment. And I go into examples there about why we would consider assault or threats, including some verbal threats and including stalking, to be types of aggression. And the basic answer is, um, in my view, is that my thinking of rights, the, the non-aggression principle as first formulated for libertarians is that you have the right to – you don't have the right to initiate force against others, but you do have the right to retaliate against others. And you see there's a certain symmetry there. The symmetry is that force is permissible only if it's in response to force. But if someone did not use force against you, you can't use force against them. If they just insult you with their words – then you can insult them back with your words. So there's, again, a, a type of symmetry, but you can't use force to stop them from insulting you, <clears throat> um, etc. There are some interesting side cases, or not really exceptions. They sound like exceptions at first, but like I believe, for example, the, the traditional doctrine of fighting words is not completely unlibertarian. That is that certain words you say to someone are so provocative that if they sock you in the jaw because they're upset, then it's not really a crime. Now, I think you could actually score that with libertarian doctrine uh, based upon sort of an implied consent notion. So, for example, if, if uh, two boxers go into the ring to box, then they both assented or consented to 
receiving each other's blows. If a girl could, uh, leans her head towards her boyfriend to kiss him, then she's consenting towards him actually kissing her. So there are certain things you can do that demonstrate your consent, playing football, etc. Two guys in a bar, they get upset with each other, they say, let's step outside and fight, or let's have a duel. They're both consenting to that, so it's not aggression in that case. And I think you could make a, an argument that if, if uh, you walk up to a big burly uh, um, Harley's biker in a bar that you don't know, you know, tattoos and a leather jacket, a tough guy, and you just walk up to him and look him right in the face and say, you know, uh, your, your, your mother wears army boots naked, then you're basically inviting a punch. You're, 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 saying, you're saying in unspoken language, let's go fight. So if he punches you, I don't think it's unconsented to, or you could argue that. So it's not that fighting words justify violence or that speech justifies violence. It's that certain actions and types of speech manifest your consent to being hit, being kissed, whatever. So anyway, that's a tangent, but in any case. Uh, before I go further, uh, let me see what some of the questions are. Sebastian says, how much, what percentage of the legal categories or principles of the positive law would go away by implementing libertarian law? Uh, I think the answer today would be far different than the answer from 200 years ago. Say 200 years ago, the great bulk of the positive law, that is the law actually enforced in most legal systems, let's say the, the great western systems, um, England, uh, Europe, the great bulk of that law was, was private law. There was some public international law, which I think is also largely compatible with, international, with libertarian principles. There was some so-called so public law, like exceptions from private law. By private law, we mean all the law that re governs uh, relations between private individuals. So that would include contract law, property theory, uh, mar law about marriage, uh, uh, ownership of children, inheritance law, uh, torts, and even private crime. That great body of law that developed in the last couple of thousand years in the Roman system, in the common law system in England, up until a couple hundred years ago, um, was largely – largely compatible with libertarianism. I'd say a good – at least half, maybe 75, 80, 80 percent, maybe more, would compatible with what you would uh, – it seems like a reasonable working out of the abstract libertarian principles, put it that way. Um, and the exceptions would be public law exceptions, giving the king or the crown certain exceptions, the right of eminent domain, uh, exempting the uh, exempting the, the, the actors of the state from the operation of the law with sovereign immunity. Uh, the kind of thing that Basquiat complained about. Um, so, accepting the public law, the, the state exceptions, um, you know, conscription, uh, the rules of war, things like that. So, I would say the great bulk of the private law was was very compatible with libertarian principles because it was a spinning out of intuitive principles of justice and property rights that everyone faces practically on a day-to-day -day basis. And the mission of these courts and the mission of the law finders in Rome, the mission was to try to find a resolution to a situation compatible with justice, try to find the just or the right result. They didn't always succeed. They weren't always guided by purely libertarian principles. There was, all, there was sometimes legislative encroachments or sometimes pressure by the crown, but by and large, the rules that did develop over time that were systematized and codified by private codifiers, like Justinian, it wasn't really private, but okay, it was a codification of what had gone before, Napoleon, uh, Blackstone, Coke, uh, the restatements of the law in the U.S. Um, these principles are largely compatible, but since about 100 years ago, We've had legislation has risen to become a dominant, if not the dominant, source of private law in most developed legal systems. So basically the, the, the private under framework of property rights and private law that was developed more or less in a libertarian way has been gradually uh, supplanted by huge legislative and statutory schemes and regulations uh, uh, promulgated by administrative agencies of these bureaucratic states that we have now. So I would say right now, I mean, the Code of Federal Regulations in the U.S., which is just the administrative regulations and the, uh, the, the, uh, the United States Code, USC, which is the codification of all congressional legislation that's still in force, are huge, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. 
and those regulate more and more areas of private law and life. So we're to the point now where a much higher percentage of what's called positive law, the law enforced by the state, is sourced in the Constitution or legislation or regulations rather than the organic private law that is left over from the golden age of law. I don't know the percentage. I would, I would, I would venture to say over half, well over half of law has been supplanted by legislated law of one form or another, if not, if not 75%. And I would say well over two-thirds of that legislated law is unjust, if not almost all of it. So at this point, I would say you, you can only give um, uh, presumptive just status to a smaller fraction of the ex whole body of positive law, let's say in the West, maybe 20 percent, something like that. And that's primarily going to be where the private law, the common law rules still operate. Um, and that's primarily in the state legal systems, which – which largely have embodied the Uniform Commercial Code and codes that did codify largely libertarian common law principles from the past. Anyway, I can't think that's enough on that topic. Let me see if we have any other questions in the meantime. If you have a question, let me know. Uh, I can go back for a minute to the uh, question we were on, which was the um, – and by the way, feel free to type a comment below. I think I am getting comments. If I missed one, just retype it. I don't know if I missed any because I'm getting used to this interface. I'm a little surprised at the scale. This looks like I have to hold the phone vertically, so it's not a widescreen thing. That's fine. A little odd. Um, okay. So we were talking about assault, right? And um, Well, let, let, me, let me go to a little tangent. This gets a little bit into one issue I've written about, about with my friend Pat Tinsley, which it talks about the, the concept of causality in the law, how important it is to have a, a solid view of causation and causality. And this does tie in with, again, why I keep saying that to have a solid understanding of the principles of justice and libertarian principles, you, you really have to be informed by economics and in particular Austrian and in particular Misesian praxeological economics. And the reason is because Mises – quite properly recognizes the role of causality, right? That we have to, we have to recognize that all human action um, is based upon a certain understanding of the laws of cause and effect in the world, right? There's a causal realm. This is what the natural sciences study. And then there, there's, a, uh, um, there's a teleological realm. That's right, the, 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 the rules that apply to the study of the consequences of decisions that human actors make. That's what we basically call economics, right? So we have uh, purposive action and analysis of that, and we have an understanding of the causal laws of nature. And the reason this is important is because Mises explains that the structure of human action is to be an actor who's aware of his status as an actor and aware of the, uh, the nature of other human beings to the extent that they exist in society with them as being fellow actors with their own purposes, you have a purpose in mind, and a purpose means an end, an end state that you want to achieve, which implies that you have a vision or a forecast or an understanding of what you believe or think might happen in some time in the future. And you think that what's going to happen in the future is not what you want to happen. Right? You're dissatisfied. You're made, as Mises calls it, uh, uneasy with the prospect of what's going to happen. Okay, so the whole purpose of – the whole nature of human action is that people have a awareness of their, of their status in the world, and they have some idea that we're traveling through time, and there's something that's going to happen in the future unless they intervene somehow. Now, the intervention – requires the use of the employment of scarce means in the world, right? But you have to employ them according to their nature, right? So you have to have some knowledge in your mind about the way the world is. You have to have some uh, forecast of the way the world will be if you don't intervene. And you have to have some knowledge of what's available to you to make a change, right? So you have to have knowledge about what the causal laws are, what the laws of physics are. What, what tools, what means 
or in your environment that are available to you to manipulate, to grapple with, to grasp, to handle, to somehow change the course of events. <clears throat> so this is the entire essence of human action. This is what we do. It's breaking it down into a very analytical um, uh, structure. So we use our knowledge about the way the world is and the way the causal laws are that we think to imagine what will happen in the future. We imagine possible things that we can do in the future. Right? This is where the economic idea of opportunity cost comes in. You can only do one thing, and the other things that you have to be sacrificed would be the opportunity cost of that. So you choose your most valued end, and you pursue it by selecting and using means that you believe, with your knowledge, are calculated to help you obtain um, the end. So this is why causation is, is embedded in the entire understanding of what we do every second of our lives when we act. We are operating on some kind of understanding of what causality is um, and causal laws. Okay, So this is why causation and libertarian theory is also important. When we want to ascribe responsibility to someone for committing an act that we think is wrong, that needs to be protected against or defended against or punished or retaliated against or condemned as wrong, Number one, we have to view these other people as human actors. That is not robotic automatons with no purpose. It's best to understand fellow humans not as robots, but as fellow humans like we are with ends and purposes. And then from our understanding of the way our lives work and the way uh, what we've experienced in terms of interaction with others, we develop a sense of what their intention probably is. To fully characterize someone else's action, you need to understand what their purpose is or their end. So you need to characterize them as actors. You need to characterize what they're doing as an action, which means there's an end, there's a means employed, and there's a certain purpose. So you have to you have to try to use what Mises calls Verstehen. It's a German word meaning the understanding. You have to characterize what they're doing in a certain way. So doing that is what the legal system does in a more formal way. For example, that's why the legal system um, – uh, distinguishes different types of murder, right? So there's first degree murder, second degree murder, negligent homicide, manslaughter, things like that. Vehicular homicide. They 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 generally uh, they generally characterize the action as the same <coughs> in some sense. That is, the outcome is the same. Someone was killed. There's a homicide, the death of a man. And it was an intentional action. If it was totally unintentional, it wouldn't be a tort at all. You wouldn't be responsible for it. You know, if an asteroid falls on my neighbor and kills him, it's not a tort by the asteroid or by me because I had nothing to do with it, and the asteroid didn't have any intentionality, no mens rea. So it wouldn't be an action. There's no, there's no responsibility to be ascribed. Likewise, if I have a seizure, you know, I'm sitting next to someone at a movie, and my, I just have a seizure – and my hand just starts flailing wildly and strikes this other person and harms them, um, it's not really an intentional action, so arguably I'm not responsible for that. It, let's assume it's the first time and I had no reason to, to think. So uh, you have to have some degree of intentionality. Now, the way I look at it is a, uh, you have a spectrum, a continuum, going from fully intentional down to mm, sort of intentional, which is what we call in the law negligence. Okay, so if I don't want to kill you, but I'm just not being careful enough, and my car accidentally runs into you and I kill you, it's partially intentional, not fully intentional. The outcome is still the same. If there's a death, but the intentionality is lower. So my view is sort of you have to imagine the way we classify the, the severity of the crimes and therefore the, the, the severity of the retaliation or the restitution that could be uh, a response to that is like a product of the – of the outcome and the intentionality. And so um, it's worse to intentionally murder someone than to mur tend to accidentally kill them So you're, because your intentionality is like one thousandth of that of the murder or something like that. So you have to take these things into account, and that's roughly what the law does in having a lower, lower punishment for someone who accidentally commits homicide. Uh, 
as a, someone who commits first-degree murder. And it's why second-degree murder and manslaughter don't have as severe penalties as first-degree murder, and I think that makes sense. And I go into that in that causality article and also in my punishment and proportionality article, if anyone wants to look in more detail. Okay, we have another question. Tony Vincent, what do you think of the HHH Physical Removal Service? Uh, that's very funny. There, there's a Facebook site called uh, HHH, which means HAPA, Physical Removal Service, just kind of... Um, I'm not sure if it's making fun of Hoppe or making fun of his critics. I can't tell. It's just a funny, irreverent site, sort of riffing on a comment Hoppe made about um, private property communities, uh, private covenant orders, um, having to exclude certain types of people. Uh, I don't know th what, what, can I, what can I say. It's private. It's a, it's a free world. People can riff as they want. It's, I think it's sometimes kind of funny. Uh, I don't know who's behind it, by the way, and I don't care. Sebastian. Do you know – Sebastian has a question, and I'm going to stop this shortly because it have been 25 minutes already. I'll go a few more minutes. I don't want to go much past half an hour. Do you know of any further research on your blog post that the Catholic Church is a voluntarily funded elective monarchy and therefore not a state? What potential avenues for the propulsion – let me see here. Uh, let me stop there because I can't read all that right now. Um, Look, I don't have a lot of uh, uh, detailed study of the Catholic Church. My, my only point in that post, which was from a few years ago in the Lou Rockwell blog, I believe. I, I noticed I'm talking fast again. I'm going to slow down. My only point was um, that uh, all the criticism of the Catholic Church, not the recent criticism about these um, uh, pederasty scandals. That's, that's a different matter. Those are sound like legitimate crimes that um, that uh, should be classified that way and dealt with a certain way. Um, but people criticize the Catholic Church because it says you can't use uh, contraception, or because and it's, and and it and it and it so-called coerces people with the threat of hell if they don't obey certain dictates. Now, as a as a libertarian, I don't give that any credence whatsoever. I mean, it's ridiculous. People are free to leave the church. They're free to do whatever they want. If they want to believe those teachings, they can. Uh, they don't have to. So it's not an act of aggression. It's not an issue of libertarianism. And if that's all the, the state did to me, if the state just hectored me all the time, told me I had to pay my taxes or I would go to hell, right? then I would just ignore them. They wouldn't be uh, a criminal organization then. I actually would be happy to have an organization that 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 demanded tribute on the pain of condemning me to hell in the afterlife because I would just ignore them and I wouldn't pay any taxes. The state does more. The state actually threatens you with going to jail in this life <laughs> if you don't pay taxes. That's real aggression. So I think we need to focus on what real aggression is. And my only point was it's kind of amazing that this um, – the, the, the Holy See, Vatican City, which, is, which isn't recognized as a sort of actor under international law, not quite a full state, but has some treaties with it, so it's seen as an international actor. Um, it's kind of interesting that the Holy See, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, is in effect a state with, in a sense, over, I don't know, about a billion quote-unquote citizens, right? Catholics around the world. You know, they're citizens of their own states, really, but they pledge allegiance to the Catholic Church. They give tribute to it. They pay it. My point is they whatever they pay is paid voluntarily. And as far as I know, in today's times, the Catholic Church doesn't commit any aggression whatsoever, except for the actions of the priests and with the young altar boys, which is a different issue. I was an altar boy for three or four years, and uh, I don't recall any anything bad happening. Maybe I, I blinked it out. I'm just kidding. It was fine. Um, so the Catholic Church is basically a quasi-state with a billion citizens, which doesn't impose any taxes, doesn't cause any wars, doesn't put anyone in jail for anything, doesn't outlaw anything with a threat of, uh, of any kind of physical force. So that was my only point, that it's in a sense the most libertarian state in the world right now. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Got a comment, no taxes in hell. Sounds decent. That's true, and that's where all the fun people will be, right? Um, <coughs> Oliver Westcott has a question. 
do you see a practical difference between a world of states and a world of private homeowners associations? Uh, absolutely, uh, mi uh, millions of, of differences. Um, primarily, uh, a difference in terms of justice, right? States are not just, and private associations would be just. So that's the primary difference in terms of justice, in terms of ethics. But in terms of the way the world would look, it would be greatly different for several reasons. Number one, you would have, instead of 200 states, you would have uh, tens of millions of these associations. So the numbers would be so much greater, and the size would be so much smaller, right? So that's a huge difference right there. And their purpose would be to satisfy the customer. It wouldn't be to um, you know, set up a, a propaganda organization whose, whose function is to exist and survive and to exploit the people um, as much as possible. And I would recommend you, you look at Hoppe's great book on banking in nation states, uh, a great article, which is in the, uh, the, I think the Review of Austrian Economics. It's also in one of his books. I think it may be in... Um, Economics and Ethics of Private Property, or in The Great Fiction. I forgot which book it's in. Uh, he, ta he discusses there the process by which the state gradually monopolizes areas of human life to exert more and more control over, uh, over the, uh, the population that it basically is exploiting. Uh, it, you know, it, it sets up control of money, roads, defense, police, the law, uh, even language in some cases, right, and um, and education too, education of the children. Um, so it does these things insidiously. Um, whereas a homeowner association would have no uh, ability to monopolize anything like that. So yes, there'd be any number of, of differences. There could there could arise uh, private associations or covenant communities, as Hoppe calls them, that you wouldn't personally like, but. You know, if you stayed there, you would actually be consenting to the rules. And if you didn't like it, you could join one of the other 10 million in the world. So it would be a completely different landscape. Much more liberty, much more prosperity, much more free markets, much more freedom. And, you know, corruption as we know it now would be orders of magnitude different and less in my, in my view. I think I'm going to shut this down now. This was an experiment. I hope it didn't go too badly. I think it was okay. Next time I'll use a proper microphone. I'll just get my phone charged ahead of time. Like I said in the beginning, I could actually use this. I've tried it on my phone. This is the one I use, my Audio Technica, for my computer. And it actually works on my iPhone if you have a, an adapter, which I have. You have to have a USB adapter. But the problem is this adapter has no power a little power plug-in, so you can't have power going to your phone at the same time. So next time I'm going to try a proper microphone. Anyway, uh, if this works out all right, we'll try it again. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Feel free to post any questions, and maybe I'll get to them in another FaceTime, Facebook Live uh, video. Thank you. Bye-bye.